thus, God's grace blots out the law, the devil, through sin, has just about wrecked this world of ours. We live in an age of rebellion against all restraint and law. Our nation stands aghast at the big city gang defiance of social order and property rights, including the right to live. Murder, robbery, and personal assaults have become the trademark of both urban and suburban 20th century life. Each day as we read the newspaper it seems that the quality of life has edged downward a little bit further. At times we are tempted to believe that things can get no worse and that conditions have hit rock bottom. Yet, the next day, even more violent bizarre crimes are reported and we simply shake our heads eye and disbelief. It is difficult to comprehend how a nation like America with its rich Christian heritage could ever depart so far from its founding principles. Even the non-Christian countries are not plagued with as much crime and overall violence as this so-called Christian nation. More crime is reported in Washington, D.C., in 24 hours than Moscow reports in a full year. No doubt the reporting methods are not the same, but it still presents an alarming picture. The problem becomes more serious when we realize that lawlessness also reaches into the area of religion and affects millions who would never think of killing or raping. It is probable that the great majority of church members in America today carry few convictions against breaking at least one of the Ten Commandments. A very insidious doctrine has been developed in both Catholic and Protestant theology, which has tended to minimize the authority of God's great moral law. It has led many to look lightly upon transgression, and has made sin to appear unobjectionable. In fact, sin has lost its horror for multitudes, and has become an acceptable mode of life for both youth and adults. Witness the current trends in lifestyle that support this view. How many young men and women are living together without benefit of marriage? Yet they do not believe such living arrangements should be designated as sin. A large portion of shoplifters are professing Christians, and most of those who belong to churches believe that there is no sin whatsoever involved in violating the seventh-day Sabbath of the Fourth Commandment. How can we explain this paradoxical situation among those who profess such high regard for the Bible and such love for Christ? This chime becomes more significant when we consider the historical position of Christianity toward the Ten Commandment law. Almost all of the great denominations have officially placed themselves on record as supporting the authority of that law. Yet very subtle errors of interpretation have crept into the modern church, leading to the present state of confused loyalty to all the Ten Commandments. How earnestly we need to look at that law and study its relation to God's grace and to salvation itself. It is so easy to accept the popular cliches concerning law and grace without searching out the biblical facts by which we will finally be judged. We must find authoritative scriptural answers to questions like these, in what sense are Christians FRE from the law? What does it mean to be under the law? Does God's grace nullify the Ten Commandments? Is a Christian justified in breaking any of the Ten Commandments because he is under grace? These are the questions we shall address ourselves to in this important study. Let us push aside the rubbish of confusion that has obscured the truth about how men are saved. Multitudes have heard emotional discourses on sin and salvation, but they still do not understand the logic and reason that require a blood sacrifice. Can you imagine the horror of standing before a judge and hearing the sentence of death pronounced against you? Probably not. But you have felt the driving guilt and fear when God's word stabs you with this sentence. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23 Why fear and guilt? Because, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 The words are there and the meaning cannot be mistaken. The word, oh, might just as well be spelled John Smith or Mary Jones or whatever your name happens to be. The shocking fact is that you are under the sentence of death. You have been found guilty before the law, and there is no court of appeal in the world that can reverse the sentence and find you not guilty. The fact is that you are guilty, just as guilty as sin. According to 1 John 3, 4, sin is the transgression of the law, and you must plead guilty to breaking the law. Whose law did you break? Paul answers quickly, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Romans 7, 7. There it is. The great Ten Commandment law is the one that was broken, and it demands death for the transgressor. 
In desperation, the sinner searches for a way to be justified in the sight of that broken law. How can the sentence of death be turned aside? Can man atone for his sins by obeying the commandments of God for the rest of his life? Back comes the answer in language that no one can misinterpret. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Romans 3.20 Listen, there is a reason why works will not justify a soul. If a man is found guilty of stealing and is sentenced to ten years in jail, he may indeed justify himself by works. By serving the time of his sentence, the man may satisfy the claims of the law. He is considered perfectly justified and innocent because he has worked out his deliverance by fulfilling the sentence. In the same manner, a murderer may be justified by works if he serves the fifty years of his sentence. But suppose the sentence is death instead of fifty years. Can the prisoner then justify himself by works? Never. Even if he should